get nominated for awards. This guy wins awards. Brian Gumbel, host of HBO's Real Sports and former co-host on Today. He is going to be presented with the Lifetime Achievement Award at this year's Sports Emmys. That'll be coming up in New York City on May 22nd. Brian, good to see you. How many Emmys do you have? Oh, God. I, I don't know. I honestly don't know, Dan. Um, I, I mean, I, I, the shows on which I've worked, um, I'm, I'm going to guess it's close to 58 or something like that. <laughs> Where do you put them? I, I don't. I really don't. That's the truth. Um, I'm, I'm sitting in my home in Florida right now, and I must honestly tell you there's not a one of them here. Um, I, I keep some in New York. Um, I, I, I don't. I honestly don't know where most of them are. I really don't. It doesn't it doesn't mean I'm not appreciative. It just means that I'm not. I'm not real big on. I shouldn't say that. I'm not. I'm not terribly big on awards. I've never been concerned with them. How about you and Bob Costas do like a yard sale? Just put your sports <laughs> enemies out there, because because Bob's got quite a few of them too. Yeah, I know he's got a bunch. I think it just means we're both getting up in years. I mean, as usually happens when you when you when you live long enough, you collect a lot of stuff. What's your first real vivid sports memory? Ah, uh, wow! Real vivid sports memory. I'm going to say um, Chicago Bears 1963 NFL Championship at Wrigley Field beat the Giants 14-10. Um, I, I wound up getting tickets to that game because at a Holy Name Society meeting that morning, I'd gone with my dad. And Joe Fortunato, if you can believe this, before the championship game, was a guest at a Holy Name Society breakfast. And he had two tickets for anybody who asked a decent question. And I was a kid and I asked something stupid and everybody else was too embarrassed to ask a dumb question. And so I got the tickets and I went to the game. And that's my most vivid memory. Did it change your life? Not really. I I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I was a kid. I suspect like you who grew up, you know, not only playing a lot of stuff, but but when you couldn't go outside, play Stratomatic baseball all the time. I Never love, APBA, always Stratomatic. I love Stratomatic. Yeah, it was good stuff. I was playing Stratomatic when I was at ESPN. You know, when, Come on, serious? I swear to God. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, now, I gave up on it, I, I think, um, after high school. Um, I, I almost gave up on it because I had a friend named John Miller once upon a time who um, we had a league of Stratomatic. And one night I walked by his room and I heard dice rolling and he was giving his guys batting practice. That's when I thought <laughs> I really should get out of it. But it helped me. So when you say, hey, what kind of fielder was Rusty Staub? Well, he was a four. Or Ralph Gar wasn't a good fielder. Uh, you know, uh, who would it be? Aurelio Rodriguez would be a one. So it yeah. it just helped me understand everything about a player. And I, you know, I just absorbed all that information, whether it was going to be useful also, or not. Also, you, you could also cheat at the margins. Like, like I remember back then, the guy you wanted to put in your lineup all the time was Merrick Renew of the Cubs, who had hit something like 363, but he'd only had like 40 at bats. And even Joe Torrey, I remember when Joe won a batting title, he had like 362 or something. 363, wasn't it? 363, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was great. Uh, yeah. Where are we? The state of journalism in sports now is what to you? Um, tough to come by. I mean, I, you, you know, you know it as well as I do. I mean, but why? the reality is because, because, as is the answer with all things in sports, the money. Um Every steam house now has a, um, a uh, television arm. You have the, you know, the NBA network, you have MLB network. Um, and so as a result, I think anytime anybody gets in trouble, they can go to that network and expect a softer landing than they would if they had to face either you or me you know, on a neutral site. Um, um, given the opportunity to, to craft their own narrative, um, they're, they're able to, to go on the air there. They're over, able to, to use social media to get out their version of the truth. And it makes it more difficult for those of us who, who work in this business to try to, to elicit honest answers in an honest form. But also you have the programming now where it's a hot take. Got to have a hot take. And I just, I mean, I'm, I'm a dinosaur. I always say I'm going to have an informed take or best I can. It might not be a hot take. It might be lukewarm. It may not be warm at all. 
But my God, if you're a dinosaur, what does that make me? Well, <laughs> you're a pterodactyl too. But 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 that's how kids are kind of absorbing this business of that's what you need to have. Because for a while, when I was doing Sports Center, you had to have a catchphrase. Yeah, you right. got to have a catchphrase. Now it's you got to have a hot take, and it leads us leads us down dangerous paths here. Sure it does. Sure it does. And and by the way, you know I don't. I don't, I don't really blame the athletes. I guess if I were in the spotlight that they're in, I'd be looking for the softest landing possible. I mean, I'd figure, I, why the hell do I need Brian Gumbler or Dan Patrick? You know, I can craft my own narrative. I can put it out in the Players' Tribune. I can go to my, my team's network. If you happen to play for the Yankees or, the, you know, um, or any other big market team, um, and you can get a, a, a softer landing than you would in your studio or mine. I mean, they're, they're not dumb. What's the uh, segment or show that you got the most blowback on? Wow, there have been a bunch of them. I mean, whenever we do anything um, transgender, we get a lot of it. Um, whenever we do anything where um, race or women's rights is, are involved, we get a lot of it. Um, a lot of people, as you know all the time, are, are inclined to say, I don't want any politics in my sports. Well, I, I'm not necessarily sure human rights ever deserves to be called politics. I mean, um, you know, that, that has nothing to do with politics, trying to save a life, trying to make someone's life better. To me, that's devoid of politics. But we live in the world in which we live. Explain to me how the show works from the standpoint of your involvement during a segment. Like you send Andrea Kramer out, uh -huh. and she does a story on the voice of Hockey Night in America and then comes back. Are you, are you involved in what she does prior to it getting back, getting on the air, and then her sitting in the studio with you? To a certain extent, every step of the way, um, but varying degrees. Um, you know, yes, um, stories are greenlit. Um, and every step of the way, um, if I don't like something, I make it known. But am I micromanaging? No. I mean, I, I've said from the start that I didn't want every piece to look like it was a Bryant Gumbel piece. Um, so I try to make sure that um, all of our producers, who I think the world of, um, have as much free range as possible. There are very few things that I'll step up and go, hey, you know what? That really makes me uncomfortable. We're not going to do that. We're not going to go there. But also, and, 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 and also, by the way, I'll, I'll add this too, Dan, show you. We talked about being, being a dinosaur. Um, I've had the fight, and so far I've won the fight for 29 years. Um, I wish I could tell you how many people want us to introduce music to our pieces. Um, and, and, and I'm always, I've brought up in an era where once you introduce music, now you're manipulating the audience. Now you're not doing journalism, you're doing movie making. And, and so I, I continue to resist. But I also get the feeling you're acting as a viewer. You're seeing this for the first time and your reaction is in real time. And I don't know if, that, if that's by accident or not. No, it is not by accident, it is absolutely true. Um, every correspondent who's ever worked for us will tell you that um, I, I never, ever have a conversation with them about the finished product before we're on air. So they have no idea what I'm going to ask them. And, and, and again, my, my, my questions are really, I'm trying to give voice to what I think the viewer wants to know. Sometimes they're very crass things like, how much does he get paid for doing that? Yes. <laughs> um, does he have a family? Stupid stuff. He's Bryant Gumbel, Real Sports with Bryant Gumbel, and being honored Lifetime Achievement Award this year's Sports Emmys. That'll be in New York City on May 22nd. What do you remember most in the moment about Bird versus Magic in the national title game? Um, I remember looking around and going, wow, this really should be a, I wish this was a larger gymnasium. Um, it was, it was the, it remains, I think. That was the Utah. Venue. It was the last small venue, right? I'm going to guess. Yeah, I don't know what that seated, but that was what, Salt Lake City? Yeah, Salt Lake City yeah. in 79. I'm going to guess there couldn't have been more than 14,000 people, if that. You know, um, I, I always try, try to trick people up with this question. Everybody remembers that it was Indiana State, Michigan State. Few people can name the other two teams in that Final Four. DePaul and Princeton. You got it. Or Bob Weinhauer and... And Mark Aguirre, yes. Wait, was it was it DePaul Princeton or DePaul and Penn? DePaul and Penn, Bob Weinar. Okay, okay. Bob Weinar, Penn. All right. And uh, Ray Meyer and, and Mark Aguirre. Yes. Yeah.
But did you understand the, you know, what that was going to mean? Yeah, I, you know, I, look, I mean, I don't think it took a genius, but yes, I think anybody who, who understood basketball and had understood the, the allure of these two special players uh, would have been an idiot not to, not to appreciate the impact and, and foresee that they were going to change the, the NBA. I mean, if you, you recall as well as I did, back then the NBA uh, was not a very popular sport. Um, it, it wasn't a niche sport by any means, but it wasn't as popular as it is today because it was kind of a, a give and go sport, you know, give it to me and go to hell. Um, and these two guys um, made pass first a priority. And once they went to the NBA, they took that kind of magic, no pun intended, um, to the game. And, and I think changed it enormously and for the better. Who do you want to sit down with? Wow, what a great question. Um, you know, I mean, look, it's the usual suspects, the guys who, who are resistant to, to doing interviews. I'd like to sit with Steve Cohen. Um, I know him. We've, 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 we've had, you know, we've sat socially. We've had dinners. Um, but I'd like to sit down with him with a microphone on. I'd like to sit down with Aaron Rodgers, um, pick his brain. I'd like to sit down with um, Ben Simmons, find out why he really doesn't like basketball. Um, I, I can think of, of quite a few, really. How hard is it to not go in with a preconceived idea when you do an interview? Damn near impossible. Damn near impossible. You know what, Dan, uh, you know as well as I do. That people say, well, you know, you're journalists, you have preconceived notions about everything. And I always say there's, there's no such thing as, as pure objectivity. We are all um, products of, of our environment and our experience. And, and I guess the trick to the business is try mightily to not let those um, dictate um, your questions or your opinions of what you're hearing. Um, I, I've always thought that the, the, the thing about interviewing is very, very simple. I've told people over and over again, um, I'm doing, I'm nothing more than there to um, ask questions that I think viewers want to hear, want to hear answers and make you clarify or justify your answer. And that's it. That's it. It's very simple stuff. There's some interviews that stand out. In fact, HBO sent some interviews that you did and, you know, a list of them. And they didn't include Nolan Richardson. And I thought it was one of the best ones you've ever done because you let him talk. And a lot of interviewers don't let people talk. And the questions were open-ended. And, and I tell people a lot of times, that and the interview that Andrea Kramer did with uh, the guy who started Bikram. I thought that piece that oh, Andrea yeah. did is one of the best journalistic pieces that I've ever seen in all yeah, of my guy, years. That guy was dangerous. Yes, but she let him show you and tell you that he was dangerous. And I thought what you were getting out of Nolan Richardson was, was great because I felt like I was just listening and you weren't guiding him anywhere. And it just made for a compelling interview. And, that, and that's, a, that's a hard thing to do because we always get in the way of our interviews, it feels like. You're a smart, you're a smart guy, and that's usually what works. You know, my, my trite answer when people always say, you know, who are the good interviews and who are the bad ones? And I always say it's pretty simple. The, the good interview is somebody who has something to say and says it well. The bad one is the, is the guy who has nothing to say and says it poorly. Um, in the case of Nolan Richardson, he had a lot to say and he said it well. Yeah. I don't need to do anything. Yeah, it's it's hard for us to get out of our own way. All right, the uh, final question, and I should have led with this. It's the most important question that I'll uh -oh. probably ever ask you. Uh oh, I feel it in my plums. Go right. ahead. Are you ready? I want you to tell us what you write down on your pad at the end of every show, Brian. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I get asked it a lot. I, I'm, I'm never going to answer it. Um, a lot of times it's doodling. A lot of times it's things that are going through my head. Sometimes it's a simple thing of a reminder of somebody's name. Okay. Because I'm, I'm sure you've had those where, where you come to the back end of a sentence and you know what word you want to use. It just doesn't go in the file cabinet rapidly enough. Well, I would do that on SportsCenter when I would get done because you're on camera. Well, what do you do on camera? And then I, you know, you have to shuffle your paper. They teach you that yes. when you get started, shuffle your paper. And then I started writing down something just to kind of mock you. I'm like, well, Brian's doing it. I'm just going to write down <laughs> something. I, I'm not going to say anything. I might even draw a picture, a phallic symbol yeah. or something. But, you know, 
I, yeah. I had to do something every night doing Sports Center for 200 days out of the year. Because your hands are here, right? Yeah, here, yeah. That's the other thing. When they fade to black and your shadow is still there, what are you supposed to do? Just sit there like this? You have to do something. And I also loved tomorrow on today and yeah. postscript. Those are postscript. Yeah. And finally, let's move on. And finally, we're, all <laughs> we're all creatures of habit. Yes. And finally, a postscript. Uh, hey, congrats, Brian. Yeah. Hey, thanks very much. Yeah. It's always a pleasure. Yeah. It's good, it's good to see you. Good thanks. to see you healthy, healthy and happy. Keep, uh, how's the golf game, by the way? Actually, you know what's weird? I can't figure this out. I'm coming up. I'm 75 years old, and I'm playing better than I have in the last decade. I can't figure it out. Do you care less? Therefore, you might play better. Good question. Um, no, I, I think I, you know, it's taken me a long time to do this. I think I now understand that the importance of the game is making the score, not how you look doing it <laughs> and, and, and getting your ego out of the way. I think that's, I always thought that was Jordan's problem with baseball. He wanted to look good and, and instead of just, you might not look good, but, but you could still be somewhat successful. But Mike, wanted his swing to look really good, but it was really yeah. slow. And you don't know, he could have had a Paul Molitor swing and, and, you know, maybe been a decent baseball player. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. Look mm -hmm. at the things. Look, look at the pitches Clemente and Barris swung at. Oh yeah. 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 All right. Uh, well, congrats again. And maybe we'll hey, see you. Well, maybe we'll see there. You know, we get nominated. Like we get nominated. We don't win, but you know, if, I, understand that. if I need to be a seat filler, I'll be right when they go in lifetime achievement. Let's, hey guys, let's practice here. Lifetime achievement award. Oh, Brian. And when yeah, Brian, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah, Thank you, Brian. Thanks, Dan. That's Stay Brian Gumble. He's getting a lifetime achievement award. Sports Emmys.